today I am going to continue to talk about monsoon variability in agriculture. As I mentioned last time, a very, very important topic. And we were talking about our study region, which is a semi arid region, semi arid part of the Indian peninsula, over which groundnut is now go grown extensively. And we said that this was not always so, the traditional cropping pattern was very complex. Now, how did the transition occur? from the traditional to the current cropping pattern which comprises primarily groundnut and a little bit of other crops as well. Now, the traditional crops largely provided food grains for local consumption that is what agriculture was for in the olden days. The development programs that the government of India undertook after freedom from colonial rule such as road construction and electrification led to the spread of a market economy in this region. At the same time, food grains became available at rates subsidized by the government, this is in ration shops and hence the need for cultivation of food crops for home consumption decreased. Now, with the setting up of oil mills, the price for groundnut increased and it became profitable for the farmers to change over to a groundnut based cropping system and this is what they did. So, groundnut cultivation on a large scale in began in this region in the 70s with the introduction of the TMV2 variety which is grown even today in that region. Now, we men I mentioned last time that it is extremely important uh, to progress in this area to have an interdisciplinary group of which a farmer is a very very important member. So, farmers, agricultural scientists and meteorologists were the three people, three kinds of people who had to participate in this interdisciplinary interaction. Now, <coughs> first of all let us consider what the perceptions of the farmers are. Now, many people have a doubt how much do the farmers know. In fact, in order to understand the level of knowledge and approach of the farmers, it is important to note that rain fed agriculture has been practiced for a very long time in India. The strong links between climate variability and agricultural production of the Indian region are very well known. In fact, over 2000 years ago, Kautilya, you know who wrote Kautilya's Arthashastra who is believed to be a contemporary of Aristotle stated that for agriculture and he was referring primarily to the Indo-Gangetic plains. The optimum distribution of rainfall during the summer monsoon that is June to September is one with one third of the rainfall in the first and fourth month and two third in the middle two months. This was Kautilya's uh, perception of what is the optimum uh, what is happening. It is going back instead of front sorry. Uh, okay. Some of the crops, uh, crops grown today such as sorghum and pigeon pea have been cultivated in India for over 2000 years. Even relatively recently introduced groundnut crop has been cultivated for more than 100 years. Not surprisingly, farmers have considerable knowledge of the nature of the impact of the rainfall variability in the region on traditional crops. This knowledge is reflected in several proverbs such as the following from our study region, Uttara Chusi Yattara Gampa, wait for the Uttara rain that is rain fall during 13 to 26 September, if it fall, fails leave the place. So, if the Uttara rain or 13 to 26 September period rain fails, then it is much better to simply leave the place and not worry about the groundnut in the field. Or the following from the Indo Gangetic plains where Kautilya resided, Avat adar nahi diyo, jat no diyo hasta, bina, kha, khate, <coughs> bina khane dona gaye, pahuna aur grihasta. So, while the coming monsoon in uh, during the coming monsoon if there is no rain in uh, one of the nakshatras and while going during hasta there is no rain then both the host and the guest will have to go without food. See Ardra 
uh, is the twenty uh, second June to fifth July. So this is when the onset occurs. Onset of the monsoon occurs over the Indo-Gangetic plain. So he is saying that if there is no rain during the onset phase, that is twenty second June to fifth July, and no rain in the phase when it retreats from this region, twenty seven September to ninth October, then both the host and the guest will have to go without food in other words the crops will fail so these people had <coughs> considerable knowledge of the impact of the variation of rainfall on the crops and in particular which were the sensitive periods in which rain is very important and without rain you would get crop failure now notice that the time units used by the farmers adra punarvasu or uttara and so on all over india are not weeks or months but 13 to 14 day periods called nakshatras based on the solar calendar it is very important to remember that what they use are nakshatras based on the solar calendar which i show here and it begins with of course beginning of the year is ashwini uh, 13th april to 26th april it goes on to bharani kritika rohini and so on then we come to punarvasu which is 6 july to 19 july which is the time <coughs> after which people start sowing in our region in fact they start sowing during punarvasu itself in groundnut so punarvasu pushya and so on and so forth and you heard the name uttara mentioned uttara is 13 to 26 september and hasta is 27th september to 9th october so knowledge of the impact of variability of rain du during associated with these nakshatra during these periods the impact on uh, crops is very well known and in fact the proverbs that you looked at just now are a result of this knowledge are a reflection of this knowledge so now <coughs> meteorological data are available for several stations in the country for over 100 years but equivalent to a panchang meteorologists have not derived information on variability of rainfall from these data in these time units that the farmers use now i just want to emphasize one more point because the word nakshatra in india is used also for lunar nakshatras and these are the nakshatras that people refer to as the star under which one is born and so on and horoscopes involve these nakshatras but what the farmers use are solar nakshatras so they are by and large fixed by calendar date with a day or two this way or that way and not much more so they are really equivalent to using the biweekly or two week periods instead of weekly or monthly rainfall for which we generally make climatological averages so it is not at all difficult given the data that we have to make average rainfall or decide on what is the likelihood of a certain spell in the nakshatra and so on for each nakshatra but this had not been done earlier now i want to talk a little bit about impact of rainfall variability on the present cropping system so although farmers have considerable knowledge of the impact of the local climate and its variability on traditional crops they have not cultivated the present cropping pattern sufficiently long to provide these insights for the newer crops so the for the crops that they are cultivating they don't have as many insights as they had for the traditional crops in fact our collaboration on monsoon variability in agriculture began when one day in early october shesh giri rao who was then a student at the center for ecological sciences in our institute who is also a farmer in the paugada ananpur region asked me why it rains so often during the harvest season nowadays this was his question why is it that nowadays it is raining so often during the harvest season of groundnut now just to uh, tell you when the harvest season generally occurs generally sowing is done during 22nd june to mid august depending on when the soil becomes moist enough now harvest is about 100 to 120 days later this implies that if the sowing is done early in the sowing window that is to say around 22nd june harvest has to be done in early october counting 110 days okay whereas if it is done in early august then the harvest is in mid november now shesh giri rao was very surprised when i told him that the nature of the variability of the rainfall over the region is such that the rain is in fact maximum in early october 
which is when harvest uh, time would come if one had sown very early that is around 22nd June. So, <coughs> the rain in fact is maximum in early October and the chance of wet spells more than 50 percent whereas, it decreases somewhat by mid November and in fact, in the next few slides I will tell you what we can derive from data for daily rainfall of at Anandpur for about 90 years. Okay. So, first of all we have to note that the rainfall does vary a great deal from year to year. So, it is important to look at daily rainfall and what you see is just a rainfall within the rainy season for 3 years and you can see how different it is. This is the year in which uh, it is reasonably well distributed with one dry spell here. Then in this year most of the rain came here and very early withdrawal if you like or uh, cessation of rains whereas, here there is only one genuine wet spell and small small wet spells several of them occurred throughout the year. This is 1997, 1988 and 1982. So, the uh, total rainfall also varies from year to year, but within the season also we get considerable variation between um, dry spells which can be long like this one or this one and wet spells. So, there is considerable variability of rainfall from year to year in this region, but one can still see talk of the averages and this is actually the weekly rainfall. Now, what you see here this is the mean rainfall, mean rainfall weekly rainfall at Anandpur and what you find is that uh, in fact, the maximum is occurring in uh, late September and early October this is the maximum rainfall after which it decreases. There is a small peak towards end of May and early June, but the major peak is this one and this is the <coughs> 90 percent limit. In other words that uh, 10 <coughs> 5 percent of the years have rainfall more than this and 5 percent of the years have rainfall less than this. So, <coughs> this is the ten, have rainfall less than this this is the 10 percent limit. So, 80 percent actually of the years have rainfall between these two ranges the red line and the uh, the blue line and the blue line is the 75 percent and uh, 25 percent is generally just 0. So, quarter of the years will always have 0 rainfall irrespective of the nakshatra this is 75 percent and this is 90 percent of the mean. Okay. Now, what is the weekly rainfall? Probability of wet spells again the same thing at Anandpur this is the probability of wet spells uh, greater than 1 centimeter this is wet spell greater than 2 centimeter in that week. So, weekly rainfall greater than 1 centimeter this is the probability and this is the probability for 2 and you can see again end of September early October you get highest probability of wet spells and correspondingly lowest probability of dry spells. These are dry spells with rainfall less than 0.25 or 0 rain. This is actually probability of 0 rain and this is probability of 0.25 rain. So, you see that this period about which Sheshgiri Rao was complaining is the uh, period with highest chance of wet spells and lowest chance of dry spells and this we derived because we had data for so many years for Anandpur. So, the farmers were not aware of this important facet of the climatology of rainfall over the region. When we say climatology we mean average behavior. So, this is a very important facet of the average rainfall for the re region that it has a peak in late September early October and the farmers were not aware of it. This is why Shesh Girira asked me that question. Now, this incidence drives home the importance of deriving needed information on rainfall variability with the rich data set already available at India Med Department using time units which are commonly used by farmers in India namely nakshatras. See <coughs> these uh, climatology is derived from monthly and weekly rainfall on a regular basis, but this drives on the point that since farmers use nakshatras as time units it would be a good idea to generate information on rainfall variability with these time units. So, we have actually done this. So, rainfall for farmers we have 
use daily rainfall data for 100 years at 170 stations, these are all taluk headquarters in the state, derived basic information on rainfall variability in the time units used by the farmers that is nakshatras and this information is available both in English as well as in the local language Kannada. We have also developed an interactive system by which the probability of occurrence of given quantity of rainfall or wet spells or dry spells are given for any period chosen by the user for any station. This is available on the website of our center at the institute. <coughs> this is the rainfall variability of pa at Paugada now uh, from May to November. Paugada is very close to Anandpur and this is where the farm of Sheshgiri Rav is. And this gives the mean rainfall for each nakshatra for Paugada and two neighboring stations, uh, three neighboring stations in fact. And what you see is what you saw earlier that there is a high, there is a peak in Uttara nakshatra. That is why uh, the proverb said that if it does not rain in Uttara, time has come to pick up your basket and leave because the mean rainfall in Uttara is very high and continues to be high in Hasta as well. So, this is the nature of the mean rainfall, but what is needed is not just the mean, but probability of various events and uh, this for Paugada is the probability of rain uh, of different quantum of rainfall in centimeters here during a specific nakshatra Punarvasu, which is 6 to 19 July. And what you see is that <coughs> probability of absolutely no rain is very small, but probability of very little rain is very high in Punarvasu. And then there is a long tail with smaller and smaller chance, much smaller than 10 percent chance of some rain, uh, say 3 centimeter, 5 centimeter, 6 centimeter and so on and so forth during this 14 day period. On the other hand, you see Uttara, which is the one where you have assured rainfall you see that the probability of zero rain is actually less than 10 percent. It tends to rain quite a bit up to about uh, 10 centimeters during this nakshatra. After that the probability is somewhat lower for rainfall higher than 10 centimeter. So, information like this has been generated for every nakshatra for every station. You can also ask the question what are the probabilities of seasonal rainfall in different ranges. So, for Paugada for example, uh, we have seasonal rainfall between 35, 31 and 40 centimeters, 50 percent of the years have that, between 41 and 50, 26 percent have that, 51 and 8, 60, 16.7 and 61 and 70, 8.3. Okay? Now, we can also ask the question for some of the strategies we may need to know, what is the chance of rainfall more than 30 centimeter 100 percent because all the years in the recorded history have had rainfall more than 30 percent 30 centimeter. What is the chance of rainfall more than 40 centimeter we are now talking of total seasonal rainfall well it is 50 percent. So, 50 percent of the years have rainfall less than 40 Ch uh, rainfall more than 50 centimeters likely only in 25 percent of the years and rainfall more than 60 centimeters is very very small it is only 8 percent. So, when one has to plan various strategies this variability has to be taken into account. Now, as I mentioned before there are wet spells and dry spells and these have major impacts on the growth of the plant as well as on pests and diseases because they can trigger pests and diseases in the area. So, what we have done also is to calculate the probabilities of say 3 to 4 days of wet spell once or twice, okay? 5 to 6 days wet spell once, twice, 7 to 8 days wet spell and then 9 days wet spell, larger than 9 days wet spell which is actually never occurs. 7 to 8 days does occur during some of the nakshatras, this is Ashlesha, Makha, Pubba and Uttara. You can see Uttara the chance is very high. Altogether, 3 to 4 days spell also is maximum in Uttara, chance is 19. <coughs> then uh, uh, such spells occurring twice is uh, chance is 2 and once is chance is fi uh, 5 to 6 days once chance is 5 and 7 to 8 days 2 and 9 days more than 9 days 2 and so on. So, 
all these things have been calculated so that we know the climatology similarly for dry spells also and for dry spells you can see that <coughs> again chances of 3 to 4 dry uh, days of dry spells are also very large in uttara hasta chitra and so on and then there are of course longer dry spells possible which come uh, before the peak and after the peak here so this kind of information is available so this kind of information that we have about you know how much it is likely to rain during the total season how many dry spells you are likely to get within a specific nakshatra and so on can be used by intelligent farmers in different types of decision making even on the basis of experience of 2 to 3 decades in cultivation so uh, i consider now so this is as far as giving information on making information on rainfall variability available to farmers so that given the knowledge of the crop they are cultivating they can make some informed decisions about uh, various strategies various farming strategies now i can uh, now we will consider how the optimum strategies can be identified by combining this kind of detailed information on rainfall variability with the use of crop models and this as i said is a very powerful tool we have now in our hand which has been <coughs> validated over several regions for several crops so strategies for enhancement of yields in the face of variable climate this is what we are looking for now most of the farm level decisions such as enhancement of the seed rate that is how many seeds you plant how many seeds you sow per acre or per unit area or application of fertilizers or pesticides involve additional costs now it is important to remember that in rain fed regions such as this there are high levels of risk and low levels of production and the resources available for such inputs are very meager we have already seen how the yield fluctuates from year to year and so the profit margins are low even when the there is no loss and there are years in which there is crop failure as well so farmers resources available to the farmers are not large and therefore uh, farmers tend to avoid investment in such things this is also because the benefit of such investment itself depends on the rainfall for example if the rainfall is very poor no matter how much fertilizer you have added you will not get enhancement of yields the yield will be low because the rainfall is very low so the farmers are not quite sure of how much enhanced yield they would get by addition of fertilizers in this situation when rainfall varies from one year to the next next and they don't know which a poor monsoon year is going to be so the farmers tend to avoid such additional expenditure but there are some farm level decisions such as choice of sowing window which involve no additional expenditure but can have a very large impact on the yield this has been documented and uh, <coughs> in fact uh, you may ask the question what is a sowing window so sowing window is a specific period in which farmers sow groundnut seeds when there is adequate moisture in the soil so when there is an opportunity to sow that is to say when the soil is moist enough and the date is within the accepted sowing window such and such a date in june to such and such a date in august for example then uh, that is called a sowing window okay now in the package of recommendations developed by agricultural scientists sowing in may june is recommended okay for this uh, groundnut it is suggested that in the absence of sowing opportunities in may and june which means if it didn't rain enough in may or june so that the soil was never moist enough for sowing to be done then they say it's all right then you can do sowing in july if the if it rains adequate in july so that the soil moisture is adequate however if no opportunity occurs till the end of july then the farmers are advised not to sow groundnut at all in august in fact they recommend that some other crops should then be sown however on the basis of experience of about 2 be- decades farmers do not sow until late june so although the recommendation is that you can sow in may if the soil is moisture is adequate they never do that 
they do not sow until late June and do so in August if no opportunity occurred earlier despite the recommendation to the contrary. Remember the recommendation is that if you do not get a sowing opportunity till end of July then please do not sow groundnut in August that is the recommendation. But farmers anyway sow in August despite the recommendation to the contrary because they have experienced that in some years when the sowing was delayed to August they got very good yields not all years, but in some of the years in which the sowing was delayed to August the farmers got very good yield. So, they do not believe that the recommendation is right. So, the window now they have adopted there is from 22nd June to mid August and in this window farmers generally sow at the first opportunity that is to say if the date is within the sowing window and the soil is moist enough they will sow at the earliest opportunity. Now, this is the situation. So, what is the problem posed by the farmers? Given the background of the recommendations which the farmers did not believe because they were inconsistent with the experience they had, what when we are, uh, called for a meeting of the farmers and asked them what are the problems that you would like us to address in trying to see how best to enhance yields of groundnut in the face of rainfall variability. So, in that meeting the farmers suggested that one of the most important problems is identification of the optimum sowing window and what did they mean by optimum that which is associated with maximum production in the face of rainfall variability of the region. There is another way to look at the optimum as well, we can also look at the optimum sowing date as a sowing window as that which avoids crop failure altogether. So, minimum chance of crop failure or <coughs> maximum chance of high production would be another set of goals that one could pose. Now, we of course, uh, used a modern tool to try and figure out what would be the optimum sowing date and the model we used was uh, the peanut grow model. See, we were very fortunate that there was a group at ICRISAT led by Dr. Pyara Singh who had actually worked on this peanut grow model with the people who developed this model in US Boot and others and who later on in collaboration with scientists at the Anandpur Agricultural Research Station compared the simulated yields from peanut grow with the observed yields at the Anandpur Research Station and actually showed uh, that the model did very well. What you see here is simulated and observed uh, uh, yields from 1979 to 1990 and you see that the model is able to actually capture the rainfall uh, the impact of rainfall variability on crop yields fr from year to year. I must of course, emphasize that this model is indeed for rain fed crops, it is not for irrigated crops. And this result of Parasing and others which was published in 94 showed very clearly that in fact, the model is able to capture the variation in induced by the rainfall variation on the yields of groundnut at Anandpur. So, this was a very big asset that we had a model that was already validated for the crop variety and for the region of interest. So, this was a big asset. And uh, yeah, so work done at uh, by Singh et al. at Ikrisat showed that this model is able to simulate year to year variation in the yield of the variety TMV2 of groundnut cultivated in rain fed conditions at the Anandpur Agricultural Research Station. Now, generally, the average yield at the district level is less than the model simulated yield primarily because of the incidence of pests and diseases. Because in real life there are pests and diseases that are incident and <coughs> the model does not have any impact of pests and diseases in it. It is only a model in which the plant grows, it experiences moisture stress due to you know dry spells and so on, but there are no impacts of pests and diseases incorporated into the model. So, the model yield can be considered as a potential or maximum yield under rain fed conditions. This is the best you could do in some sense in rain fed conditions if you could somehow curb 
the pest disease incident. Now, the average yield for the region is about 750 kilogram per hectare and crop failure is said to occur when the yield is less than 500 kilogram per hectare since at that yield level it is, is not adequate to meet the cost of cultivation. So, when the money you get by selling the groundnut is less than the cost of cultivation it is a failure it is considered to be a crop failure. So, what we do is we consider a model yield of of course, less than 500 kg per hectare is a crop failure because if the model yield is less than 500 the farmers yield is bound to be less than 500. So, this is a crop failure then we consider between 1000 to 1500 kg of hectare as above average and greater than 1500 kg per hectare as very good yield. So, these are the three criteria we use. Now, what is our problem then the optimum sowing date for minimizing risk of crop failure is thus one which corresponds to minimizing the probability of model yield of 500 kg per hectare or less and maximizing the production <coughs> which is which maximizes the probability of yield above 1500 kg per hectare. Now, uh, sensitivity to different meteorological inputs. Now, we were we got this model a peanut grow model from Ikrisat from Dr. Piara Singh. Now, it required various meteorological inputs ok. For example, it required daily values of maximum minimum temperature, radiation and rainfall. Now, all these data were available at the Anantapur agricultural station for 79 to 98 which was a very good thing and that is the period for which you saw that uh, the model was shown to be va uh, validated by Piara Singh and others ok. Now, <coughs> Anandpur itself has rainfall data from 62 to 79, but does not have data on radiation and maximum minimum temperature. In addition to the data at Anandpur agricultural station rainfall data at Anandpur meteorological observatory was available to us from 1911 to 1990 at the time we undertook this study. So, we have all the meteorological inputs only over a short period, but if we could use the model for the entire period for which rainfall data is available which is a long period here 80 years then, <coughs> then actually we would be able to get much more out of the model. So, the first question was are data on temperature radiation and rain uh, temperature and radiation that essential does it make a difference uh, whether you put in the year to year variation of daily values of maximum minimum temperature radiation into the model. So, this is the first thing we did we tested the sensitivity of the model for <coughs> and we we wanted to use the model to study variation of yield with sowing day that was very clear question is the results we get for variation of the yield with sowing date uh, using rainfall and averages daily averages of uh, temperature and radiation are they different from results one would get with <coughs> rainfall as well as actual data on temperature and radiation. This is the first question we asked and what we found is that really the most critical element for the yield is the rainfall. So, variation of the model yield with sowing date based on all the meteorological data is found to be very close to that obtained by replacing the daily temperature and radiation by the daily averages for 79 to 88. In other words we are giving as an input the same pattern of daily variation of temperature and radiation year after year. What happens then? What you see is black is the actual and red are the points which are the <coughs> where we use daily averages of temperature and radiation and you can see that the matching is in fact almost too good to be true which shows that the variation and this is for different years as you can see and in different years the variation of yield with sowing date is different, but you can see very clearly that even if we use daily averages of temperature radiation and so on the basic features are captured extremely well. We do not have to worry uh, uh, about getting data which varies from year to year on temperature and radiation. So, this was a big asset. 
So, the daily rainfall data from 1911 to 1990 can be used along with the climatological averages of the daily maximum and minimum temperature and radiation for deriving the variation of the yield with sowing date. This is the first conclusion and that made it possible for us to use a big long data series rather than being restricted to some 10, 15 years where all the meteorological data that the model demands actually are available. Now, let us see what the results that we got and in these results what we have done is sorted all the results into different types you will see it here. See the pattern this is the first pattern okay. this is the first pattern and these are different years actually shown here and the common thing about these is that by and large the maximum yield occurs for early July okay or even earlier this year it is even earlier. So, the peak is occurring here for early July this is the pattern for about 19 years that you see then there are 16 years which is shown below in which in which the peak occurs much later. So, this is when optimum sowing date is between 20th and 31st July. So, it is only towards the end of July between 20th and 31st July that you have a peak and these are again several years 16 years these are 19 years. So, almost as many years the peak is somewhat later this is in early July or even earlier this is now in third week of July till the end of July. Now, these are all years in which the peak is much later and in fact, it does not vary all that much. Uh, you know once the sowing date has gone beyond this for many many years. So, for some years like this uh, you can see that the sowing date is early August the optimum sowing date is early August maximum yield you get if you sow in early August after that it is flat. So, this is a case in which sowing date has now become even later and this is 14 years for which it is now early August and in this case the optimum sowing date is between 1st and 15th August this is again uh, class 4 which are 15 of them. Now, <coughs> this is where the optimum sowing date is either in early June or in late August this is somewhat slightly confusing these 12 years or so there can be a peak in early June and another very often bigger peak in late August. So, here actually if one had to derive the optimum it would be more late August except for this particular year in which the peak is definitely in June. Then there are some years in which yield is very insensitive to sowing date these are either years in which the rainfall is very good and very well distributed these are these years here where no matter where you sow you get very good yield. There are also years in which the yield is low no matter where you sow and these are very very poor rainfall years in which which also are not very sen yield is not very sensitive to sowing date. So, note that in almost all the years the yield increases as the sowing date is postponed from May to late June. Okay. So, this is consistent with the experience of the farmers which led to the present sowing window of 22nd June to mid August. Okay. The surprising result from these figures is that the yield increases with later sowing even beyond July for many years. This is also consistent with experience of the farmers in the regions who refused to uh, you know stop sowing groundnut in August when the opportunity did not arise earlier. Now, yield is greater for sowing in late June early July only in 19 out of 87 years later sowing is associated with larger or at least as much yield in 80 percent of the years. Okay. <coughs> so, in within that sowing window itself 22nd June to mid August uh, the first part of the window late June to early July relatively few years have uh, optimum sowing date it is the latter part of the sowing window where 80 percent of the years have an optimum sowing date. So, as the farmer suggested to us 
the recommendations about the sewing window in the official package of recommendations are clearly wrong. Uh, now, the variation of the probability of crop failure that is to say yield less than 500 kilo kilograms per hectare and of probability of above average yield and very good yield is shown in the next slide. So, this is again results from the model mind you and what you see here on top is the probability of crop failure yield less than 500. You can see that <coughs> this sowing date we have started from 30th of April because they had recommended you can start sowing from May itself and in fact, the probability is very high for early sowing in May and so on close to 50 percent chance of crop failure and it decreases sharply and it is actually less than 20 percent by about um, 25th of June. So, the probability of crop failure has decreased markedly to less than 20 percent by 20th of June and by early July actually it is less than 10 percent and remains flat. So, <coughs> the farmers were quite right in abandoning the recommendation that the planting should be done in May or early July, early June because then the probability of crop failure is huge more than 1 in 3 or more than one, or around 1 in 2. So, this is a very very large probability here. Now, what is the probability of above average yield on the farm? Now, that actually increases and becomes large from in the beginning of July and remains more or less same decreasing a little bit to end of August. Now, on the other hand probability of very good yield again this is from the same model it is a integral of all the patterns that you have seen. The probability of very good yield is very high if you restrict the sowing to late July latter part of the sowing window remember the sowing window is 22nd June to mid August. So, if we restrict to uh, say last week of July and first week of August then you get very high chance of very good yields. So, this is a very very interesting result. So, uh, it is seen that the probability of failure is high about 40 percent for sowing in May or early June decreases rapidly to less than 5 percent by early July. Also for sowing in May or early June the probability of good yields is less than 20 percent it increases rapidly with sowing date up to 6 August and then decreases a bit. So, if for early sowing not only is the probability of crop failure very high the probability of very good yields is also very low here and then it increases up to this maximum and then decreases a little bit, but not that much. So, the choice of the prevalent broad sowing window 22nd June to 16th August is the appropriate one for minimizing the risk of crop failure. So, what the farmers have done is the right thing because they have now minimized the risk of crop failure. It also implies a 50 percent or higher chance of above average or good yields. So, this broad window which they have uh, come uh, <coughs> to recognize the, which they have adopted on the basis of the experience of, of about two decades is indeed an the appropriate one for minimizing the risk of crop failure and it is also reasonable because it implies more about 50 percent or higher chance of good yields above average or good yields. Now, for sowing after mid July the probability of above average and very good yields is even higher than 50 percent. So, within the broad window if we look at the smaller window of sowing after mid July mid July to mid August then is the sowing window the probability of above average and very good yields is even higher and the chance of crop failure is still very small. Okay. So, what uh, this model uh, investigation has done is to show us that actually within the large sowing window is a smaller sowing window in which the chance of getting higher yields is even higher then the sowing window which farmers have adopted by trial and error. Now, it is very important to try and understand the reasons for this. Now, why is this specific uh, window optimum? We have to understand the reasons 
because we would like to eventually extrapolate the results to areas where we do not have to run the models. If we can understand why is it that <coughs> certain set a uh, certain window is optimum for sowing for maximizing yield, then we would be able to check whether that criteria is valid in other regions and come to the conclusion as to whether the window would be optimum for that region for that crop without having to make all this uh, large number of runs with the model. Okay. So, it is very important not only to get the results for Anandpur, but also try and understand why, why this has happened. So, to understand the reasons for this, we have to consider the variation of moisture stress expressed by the plant during different life history stages. Now, why is that? We know that in rain fed regimes, the most critical element which limits the growth and yields of plants is the moisture stress. This is because rainfall is scanty and variable. So, we would like to now see what is the relationship between the moisture stress experienced by the plant in different life history stages to the optimum sowing date that we have uh, found through these model studies. Now, generally the need for water increases as the plant grows until the leaf development is complete at the end of about 60 or 65 days and remains high thereafter. Hence, in a region with scanty rainfall such as Anandpur, the moisture stress also generally increases to a maximum by about 65 days. And see, now what we have done here is for a few years, we have plotted what is the moisture stress in the model and uh, advantage is that the model actually computes the moisture stress on a daily basis while the plant is growing in the computer. So, we have the moisture stress in the model for a few years as a function of days after sowing which is the x axis here. And what we have done is purposely chosen suboptimal dates. In other words, we have chosen dates which are not optimal sowing dates for those specific years. We have chosen dates which are outside the optimum sowing date and then ask the question how does the moisture stress vary during <coughs> with days after sowing. And what you find is what I said before that as the plant grows the moisture stress increases it reaches a maximum when the plant all the leaves are out and then remains more or less steady thereafter. This is the 65 days so from 60 to 80 days or 65 to 85 days the moisture stress experienced by most of the plants is maximum. These are the plants which are uh, planted on suboptimal sowing dates. Now, if we choose the optimal sowing dates, lo and behold, a very interesting phenomena occurs. If the optimal sowing dates are chosen, in this period 60 to 80 days, actually the plant experiences no moisture stress at all. This is where ordinarily maximum moisture stress would be experienced by the plants. This is when no moisture stress is experienced at all. So, for plants for which the sowing date is optimum do not experience moisture stress at all during 65 to 85 days. This suggests that out of different critical stages suggested in literature, the most critical is the pod filling stage which occurs say 60 to 80 or 65 to 85 days after sowing. See we looked at a considerable amount of literature to ask the question which is the life history stage of the plant which is a critical life history stage in the sense that a dry spell during that stage would have a very large impact on the yield. This is the critical stage and you know the literature there is literature which suggests many almost every stage is critical. So, some papers say the first month after sowing is very important then some people and so on and so forth. Every life history stage is mentioned in some one paper or another as being critical, but what this model has been able to show is that the most critical is the pod filling stage which occurs 65 to 85 days after sowing. Now, in fact, we tested this result by more experiments with the model itself and <coughs> that is what I will talk about in the next lecture. So, in this lecture then we have seen the impact of using a very powerful tool like a crop model and we have found that in fact, the farmers choice of the sowing window 
which was empirically determined on the basis of their experience is a reasonable one because it minimizes the risk of crop failure. But we also found that within that window there is a smaller window which would lead to higher yields than the farmers would get. And so now we are trying to understand why are the yields high in this smaller sowing window which we would recommend to the farmers and link it with the moisture stress experienced by the crops and link it also to the critical life stages, life history stages of the plant. If we can succeed in doing that, if we can actually unravel what leads to the sensitivity of the crop to this dry spells in this particular time or lack of moisture stress in this particular time, the pod filling stage, then we would be able to extend the results of our study to cases where we do not have as many model runs as we have for this. So, in the next lecture, we will continue with analysis of this model. There is one more thing we will have to do. See, I mentioned that we have not taken into account pests and diseases in the model because it is not part of the peanut grow model, but in real life pests and diseases can cause a lot of damage. Therefore, we will I will talk about a heuristic model we develop for the losses created by incidence of pests and diseases, how one can combine it with the peanut grow model and therefore, get closer to reality in terms of the yields one can get on the farmers fields. Thank you.